please welcome David Pioneer. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here with you today and to talk about my company and some of the other things that I've done throughout my life. And hopefully I can share something that will make a difference to you. And maybe it'll just be a few words. Maybe it'll be a couple of things. But as over the years, as I've tried to educate myself and learn about things, I've, I've paid thousands of dollars sometimes to go to conferences over the weekends and stuff. And it's been worth it because of maybe just one little thing that I picked up from somebody else. It's uh, through their experience or through their knowledge they've been able to share with me. So hopefully I'll be able to do that today through our simple little business. Back when I was 1989, and I'll show you on the next slide, but 1989 was actually the year I graduated from high school. There's probably not many of you that were even born then, right? So that dates me quite a bit. But it's significant because it's the year that the construction monitor started. My father was the founder of the business. And he was a commercial architect up in the Wasatch Front, which is the Salt Lake, the five, eight counties around Salt Lake County. So up in that area, he was a commercial architect. And uh, he had LASIK surgery, so they wouldn't have to wear glasses. I'm not even sure that's what it was called that far back. But he had that surgery. It didn't go exactly as he expected. And so he had a real hard time doing that architecture, which back then, of course, it was not on a computer. It was all by hand, small little lines on these great big pieces of paper. So it made it difficult, and he found himself in a situation where it was difficult for him to support his family, where we'd done so well as I was growing up, and then it came to a point where he's having a hard time. So he's a little bit of an entrepreneur, and he had some ideas, and he tried out a few of them. And then one day he was out on the golf course with a buddy that owned a central vacuum store, which you plug in the vacuum, you know, it's central, so it's got one thing that works all over the house, however that works. His buddy has a central vacuum store. He's out on the golf course and his buddy says, hey, look at this thing that I've been using to find leads to get work. And he shows him just a single typewritten page that had a list of building permits that had been issued uh, where he lived, around where he lived, which I think was up in Davis County. And so my dad being in the industry and knowing construction because he was an architect, that seemed like a good idea to him. And having just dabbled with computers a little bit, which back then was pretty rare, not everybody did that, but having dabbled with computers a little bit, he thought that he could improve on that. So with that simple little demonstration or sharing from his friend on the golf course, that's what started Construction Monitor. About three months before I graduated, it was kind of a weird situation because we moved here my freshman year, right before my freshman year, and I went to Cedar High School all four years. And uh, my dad was never able to get consistent work. He was commuting for a couple years, trying a few things. My junior year, and finally, uh, my family, had, he'd, he'd had enough. It was too hard to commute, and so they moved back up. Being my senior year, had all my friends. I didn't want to go back up to Murray, even though I grew up. had a bunch of great friends up there, but I was comfortable in high school here. I lived with a friend my senior year, and so that's why I was down here, and they were up in Murray, where I started the business in about uh, February, March of 1989. And so was what he'd do is he'd go around to the city halls and just, this is public information, and it's available at any city hall. Anybody can go get it. But he found value in providing the service where he'd go and gather the information and put it into a format like this, into kind of a mailing label format. And hopefully I'm not going to bore you with too many details, but it's important to understand. So as you see the business develop, you can kind of understand the value of the information and how it changes and grows from not only sales leads, custom sales leads for construction industry supplies, but also turns into a, an important data resource where we now have a contract with the U.S. Census Bureau to provide some of their housing numbers and so forth. But he thought that he could do this. And so he started collecting building permit information. He would drive to every city, you know, up in, in, in those eight counties, there's a lot of cities. You've got Salt Lake City, South Salt Lake City is its own city, Murray, Sandy. I don't know how many of you are from up there, but it's like any metropolitan area. You have the big city that everybody knows of by, and then a whole bunch of suburbs and even outlying communities and stuff. And they all issue their own building permits, and they all do it in a different format. And so it's difficult to get, it's difficult to understand, and most of all, it's difficult to analyze and utilize until us, until my dad's business. And so he started bringing it together, and at the beginning, he was using like Corel, these are things you probably never heard of, WordPerfect, which is a precursor to Microsoft Word, Corel Ventura Publisher, and some spreads, or some uh, WordPerfect, you know, what's the word I'm looking for on those? Microsoft Word, uh, 
just word processors, word processors, and trying to format that into something that would end up like this. And there'd be hundreds of permits, so there'd just be a page, pages full of that. And so when I graduated and moved back up there with my family from high school, I started helping him with the technology side of it. And the first program I got was called DBase 3. The whole database program, which was more appropriate when you're storing information in a database, fit onto a little floppy. They were three and a half inch floppy. The whole program fit right on there. You'd slide it into the computer. You don't even have floppy disks anymore, of course, but the whole program ran on there. And so I helped upgrade him to, to the database. That was the beginning of the business, the very beginning. So I helped for about a year until I uh, left on a mission. But let me just go back a little bit because I want to say, now that you know how old I am, class of 1989, Cedar High. Um, some popular people in that class, President Mindy Benson is part of that class. She pulls our whole class up and makes us look really good. She's awesome, so class of 1989 um, here in Cedar. So really, all of my story has to do with specifically Cedar City. I did marry a Parowan girl, now I live in Parowan. Um, but of course, uh, it's all, you know, in Iron County, we're all part of the same community. My business is based, headquartered here in Cedar still, even though I have an office in Parowan. So how did I get my start? So I did start working for my dad, helping him right off. But man, it, for a lot of years, and in fact, until I worked at the college, I worked at the college twice, once as a student employee, uh, after I got back off my mission as I was playing baseball. And then again, in 2000 to 2002, I was an instructional designer. I helped uh, design online courses. And I was telling Tyler a little bit earlier, but there was an art teacher that had the most popular art class in the entire country. And she had hundreds and I think even thousands of students that would sign up for this online class. And this was back in dial-up connections, if you even know what that is. But you used to have to, your phone would connect you to the internet, not these uh, fiber connections and stuff. But they would get on these slow connections and do an art class of all things, you know, these big bandwidth intensive pictures and stuff. But, and so anyways, these are some of the things that I did for, I don't think I didn't have a second job until almost 2010. So 1989, mission for two years, from 90 to 92. And, but Pizza Hut, one of the stories I love to tell everybody is on my daughter's, on my oldest daughter's birth certificate that says father's occupation was pizza delivery guy. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's the road, right? I worked at Hermes, which right now, it, Brad's and Hermes used to be in different places. That was my first job and my boss was uh, Dean Mary Pearson. She's not the Dean anymore, but she was the Dean and, and she was awesome. And now she's the financial controller or whatever. Uh, JB's big boy. And then while I was working at SU, back off my mission, starting to have a family, uh, I delivered papers down to New Harmony, so I wasn't riding a bike. It's a little bit of a lie, but I was driving clear down to New Harmony, delivering papers in uh, Canaraville, New Harmony, and that whole big, long, rural route. Another thing I did to make money just to keep food on the table for my family was uh, these big livestock trailers. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but you haul cows or sheep in them, and while you're hauling them, they poop everywhere. And when they come back, you gotta clean it out with a big fire hose. But it paid really well. I could make like $20, $25 in an hour. And so that's what I did to support my family while Construction Monitor was starting. And when I came back off my mission, I, uh, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to get married, I wanted to play baseball. And uh, I also opened up the southwestern Utah for area for Construction Monitor. So Construction Monitor started as Wasatch Front, and then my aunt and uncle wanted to be part of it, and they opened up areas around where they lived. One of them lived in Montana, and that was a wow, crazy area. The other one lived in central San Joaquin, which is around Fresno, Visalia area over there. And so they opened up areas. I opened up southwestern Utah. But I also wanted to play baseball, which was at Southern Utah University was convenient because I walked on, I was able to do that. And uh, this is kind of a progression here, Little League, and then SUU. You can, I don't know if you can tell, but the, the number is one, which is not a number that everybody wants. It's the last uniform left, usually for the bat boy. But that year, SUU had uh, dropped their team a few years before that. So we were uh, six and 46. So six wins and 46 losses. It's a lot of losses. And I didn't play that much until the end of the season. And uh, this is kind of my story, but I didn't play that much till the end of the season. 
And then I started pitching a little bit. And in high school, my coach had me catch, so I pitched in Little League. I didn't get to pitch. I wanted to pitch, and that's part of the reason I walked onto the SUU team. And uh, UCL was on their way from Southern California up to play BYU. They stopped, as most schools did, to play us to help increase their statistics. And they were beating us handily uh, by more than 10 points, and that's usually when I went in. And I went in, but they had a scout following them. And I was throwing the ball hard enough on the radar gun that that happened to be the main scout for the Colorado Rockies organization. And I got word through my coach, and this was towards the end of the season. A few weeks later, I got word from my coach that there's a small chance, oddly enough, even though nobody had contacted me, that I might be drafted to play professional baseball. So on draft day, I waited by the phone. Me and my dad, I lived in an apartment right over here on 300 West, just north of the corner of campus and waited for the phone to ring. And I waited all day, and I waited, and then it rang. It was my mom wondering if I got the call to be drafted yet. <laughs> no, Mom. But actually, the next day, I got a call, and I had been drafted. I was the last pick. They had 64 rounds. I don't know. The teams, they go different. I mean, some of them go beyond 60. A few maybe went less. But I was like the 1,568th pick in the 1993 draft for the Colorado Rockies. Nobody else knew about me, they knew that. And so I was the last pick. A lot of guys won't go when you're that far down. So the 60th pick in the 60th round, 23rd pick in the 60th round, the Rockies had the last pick. That was the year Alex Rodriguez was drafted number one by the Saddle Mariners. He got like $2 million. I got $15,000, which for that round, I mean, they knew, they knew I was uh, older. I wasn't out of high school. They knew I needed money. And I got $15,000, I got 6,000 in cash, which paid for my wife to come watch me play in California and a wedding ring. And uh, then the other $9,000 was a $1,000 check every quarter for the three years I had left of school from the commissioner of baseball made out to Southern Utah University. And so that got me through school with fewer loans. And then when I graduated, SU, I, this picture, Anyways, there's kind of two graduation dates for me, when I walked and when I passed that stats class after the fourth time taking it. <laughs> so I did finally graduate. I really got the diploma, and other than the discrepancy in the dates, that's my story for SUU. So and now coming back to Construction Monitor, I was working all these different jobs, running the southern Utah, southwestern Utah area. And then in 1998, my dad decided to, you know, be, I was doing all the technology, doing all the tech work. At that time, I just started a, we'd barely begun with a website. That was about the time I set up a co-hosted server up at X Mission in Salt Lake. And um, so we became partners in 1998. And I, I remember my dad, one of the stories that he told that my son reminded me is that just a couple years after he started Construction Monitor, not the couple, at the very beginning, two parts of the story. At the very beginning, he got a check. Now, this is a subscription-based business, which is a, a great type of business to have because it's like Netflix, all the, everything's subscription now. Back then, not everything was subscription. But subscription, you're going to keep getting income and money, right? Once somebody signs up, you provide a valuable service, and they keep, they keep subscribing, or they forget they're subscribing, and they're still paying, but they keep subscribing. All right, well, he got a check. He'd been working and he got a check and it was that point where he had to decide and he was having a hard time, you know, and, but he finally got somebody to sign up and it was that moment that he had to decide, am I going to commit to this? Am I going to do it? Because if I cash his check, I'm committed to one customer. I don't know if it was for a six month or a one year subscription, but it was probably for a one year subscription. And if I cash his check, then I'm committed for at least a year. I mean, whether I'm losing money or making money, I got to fulfill that obligation for a year. He cashed it and uh, now the rest is history. Uh, that him, his idea and him starting this business, you know, has uh, been a benefit and a blessing to another two generations now. I passed it on to me in 2014 and now it's still going running strong. So you can kind of see some of the numbers down here. Grab a drink of water. Excuse me. So when we first started out just the Wasatch Front, it was just one area. I've got a slide in here that we have like over 90 areas now and cover the entire country. But at the beginning, these are some of the latest numbers. 
of how many building permits. This was just snapshot of yesterday, but last 12 months we've entered 3 million building permits. And so that's like, you know, a lot per day, even per hour, in eight or 10 per minute that are going in there constantly from all over. Uh, yeah, so I guess, let me make sure I don't miss anything here. Okay, so to kind of describe this business that my dad built is how it worked. Is at first, and me and my brothers and sisters all participated in this, but we took some of the earliest versions of laptops you've ever seen. They had small keys, the batteries didn't last. In fact, I, I don't remember really being able to work on a battery, I had to plug it in. But we would go in and take the information, like I showed you back on that first slide from the building permit, you know, you got the valuation, the date, the contractor and their information, the owner and their information, and maybe an architect, and we'd type all that in as we went to the cities. As it got more and busier, we'd take cameras, little digital cameras around, and they were bad, low quality, low megapixel then, but it would work. Take pictures and then come back and type it in from those pictures so we could be a little quicker in the cities. And then it got to the point where we were using scanners, and so we'd go in and scan the information. And we do that from all the jurisdictions. And we started to expand. And this is part of what I did, my role on top of, and for, from the beginning, when I came back from my mission and started digging in, and I'd done a little bit of it before, but when I came back and started digging in, I was a heads down programmer. And I loved it, to be honest with you, I loved it. I was a heads down programmer until about 2008, and then slowly phasing out till 2010, but that's all I did for the company was write all the technology. At first we used Microsoft Access, well we used DBase and then we moved to Microsoft Access and then to SQL Server is the, the database platform that would store all this information. And then it became an online app. I developed an online app in the beginnings of that in 2006 I think it was. And then, uh, yeah, and then I started moving more into management and I'd travel around to the city so I'd go to California for instance in like Kern County around uh, is that Bakersfield? I can't, I can't remember right now. But anyway, I'd go to California and I'd open up this whole area. I'd drive to 35, 40 cities over a few days and open it up and collect these areas. Toward now, we cover the entire country. So the pandemic changed things a little. We used to have to visit every city and we had people, independent contractors, that would visit each city. And they would they go there every week and they'd get that information. And then we had other independent contractors, mostly work at home people that would enter the information. They'd key it in from those scanned images and into that. And, you know, three million, now it's three million building permits per year. And 24 million total. We, we've made a conscious decision not to get the real small stuff. And this is really boring stuff when you get into types of building permits, but you have to have a building permit for everything, including, you know, water heaters and even stuff that doesn't mean anything to anybody. But if you're somebody that sells carpet, central vacuum systems, or anything that goes, you look around here, I mean, these projectors, lighting, fire sprinkling systems, anything like that, this is a valuable lead source, and that's what this whole business was built on. And we could tell you exactly who was building new homes, new commercial buildings, remodeling both of those, swimming pools, solar permits, just everything. And so it was a real targeted list. It was a great way for you to get business if you had anything to do with the whole industry at all. And yeah. Do you more so target the subcontractors or the, ge the generals? Yeah, so we call them suppliers. So the generals, there's some, and you'll see we have some top builder reports and some statistics. So like Ivory Homes, a big builder in Utah, Hence Homes. They like to see where they're at on there, and sometimes they'll use it to get uh, advantageous interest rates at the bank or something. So a little bit, the contractors are just looking the statistics. It's mostly the suppliers, like if you supply carpet, you know, office furniture, things like that. They're the real ones that for the, for the lead source type part of the business, which it was built on, it was just like that. So, uh, yeah, kind of the subs. I mean, well, really it is the subs, but they're supplying both services and products. So as far as like on the general side of things, would it be also beneficial for them to be on there as well because you know, now you get cheap rates on some products? Yeah, so they do, I mean, they, they want to, first of all, the big thing we had in Utah was, or Ivory was the top builder for lots of years and then a couple national companies, DR Hart, and started coming in. They like saying, and they put this and would credit us sometimes, the number one home builder in the state of Utah, you know, based on construction monitor. And they were by long ways forever. And then they started getting closer. So they were, they were very interested in making sure we weren't missing anything. Because if you're gathering three or 400 cities building permits across 
across the state, and cities are not always to easy to deal with, but there's a chance you might miss, and we tried really hard not to, but there's a chance you would miss one of their permits, you know, or something. And every permit mattered when, you know, they're at the top of that list and their number one builder and DR Horton's like just a few permits behind them. You want to make sure that you're accurate. So for the generals, I mean, when a building permit's pulled, listen, the general, the contractor's already listed because that's part of the required information. And so really, this is, this is one of the reasons that we've thrived in this space because it seems like a small space. I mean, the permit's already out, it's too late. Well, in some cases, that's, that's true. For the general, it's, the only thing it does for them is the statistics, but for any of the subs, and a lot of times, they do have subs that they work with almost all the time. But as a, stub, there, as a sub, there's usually still a chance. Even lumber companies and cement companies that are at the very beginning of the process have found our publication to be advantageous. And they will find, they will find work from it. So, all right. And then, <clears throat> so over the years, and this is one of the things so I like, I mean, things have gone well for me. I've been blessed in a lot of ways, and I'll admit it. I mean, I'm sure I've made some decisions I mean, I had to have, right, to make this work out so well as we'll talk about more. But I've been blessed, and I've learned a lot of things from a lot of other people. I'm a big believer in Automobile University. You know, if I'm driving somewhere, I'm usually listening to some business, a business audible, business book, business tape. I love self-help. I mean, that whole genre of making yourself better, trying to learn from somebody else, you know. I am not these Seth Godin, these, you know, these people that just, know all this stuff, but I like to learn from them. And I was big on Zig Ziglar. He's kind of fading a little bit, but I love Zig Ziglar. You know, all these, all these motivational, all these business, especially when I see one of the big books that I really like, and I think is an important part of the success of any business is Michael Gerber's um, Systems, well, I can't, what? E-Myth, thank you, E-Myth Revisited. So I don't know if you've read that book. And before I get there though, I want to say when I was in college, I had a class from Dr. Alan Hamlin and this is one of the, he had us read How to Win Friends and Influence People, and that's probably number one on my list, but that was a good book too, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and we read that during one of my semesters, and it made a huge difference in my life. I've read that several times. It's a great book, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. But yeah, Michael Gerber, The E-Myth, talks about systematizing your business, right? And really, you can make, we, I paid a consultant, I mean, six figures is maybe a little, on, right around six figures to come in with us for, it. he came in for a whole week and then he worked with us for the rest of the year just to help us create systems for our business and construction monitor. And so any business that you want to start, I mean, systems are the way to do it. And that's why franchises are often, you know, percentage-wise more successful than non-franchise businesses because they have a system and they know it works. And they can almost predict based on geography, population, and the product, you know, that they sell, how successful you're going to be. And that's why they charge, you know, fortune. And they get a fee for everything you do. But they have a system. The franchises have a system that they know works. It's been proven. And so, yeah, systems, I think, are important. But I went to a conference, and I go to conferences all the time. And like I said, sometimes it'll be exorbitantly if that's a word, <laughs> expensive, you'll pay $5,000, $10,000 for three days. I mean, it does get out there. I can't even imagine how much they charge now. But you'll hear one thing that will make a difference. And it's been simple things as I saw when I was still doing a lot of programming, I went to one and they talked about a software package they were using that used source code control. You'd have to be in programming to understand that. But I brought that back, and that was the beginning of us using source code control, which we should have always been using, but I finally understood it, and I knew a software that could handle it. Right up to tax savings ideas that have saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars over the year in ways to not avoid taxes. I mean, two things, right, death and taxes, but to either defer taxes or to minimize taxes in a legal way. And then just ideas for the business. You just can't go wrong. You know, learning lives forever. You just got to keep learning as long as you can. And that, that's been important. But I had somebody share, this is kind of an odd thing, but a guy told me these three things when I went to a conference, it was a business conference for business leadership type thing. And he said three things to me that you gotta remember. Um, first of all, create systems for your business. And that's where I was going with that whole long story. But create systems for your business. Um, don't give up on your dreams. And then this was a weird one, and I've always thought about this, but your time is worth $200 an hour. 
and you guys are like, oh, you know, nobody makes $200 an hour, right? And I didn't make $200 an hour. But the point was, is listen, there's only so many hours in the day. And what is your time worth? You know, some people will spend, I don't know, it's just like decisions you make. And I can't even think of a good example, like traveling, you know, you'll drive, you'll drive nine hours instead of a two hour flight to save $100 or $75 or whatever. But your time is worth money and there's only so much time in the day. And so everything about the business is building a good team so you don't have to do everything. You can only do so much. And yeah, what's your time worth? So I remember that, that was one thing. I went to that conference, I did pay a lot for it and just that conversation. And a lot of times it is a side conversations over lunch or whatever where you hear things that stick with you and you can apply them to yourself. So now I wanna jump a little bit ahead and talk about when I bought the business from my dad. This was in 2014. Uh, he was still doing, he's still here. He, he lives in Parowin, just a half a block from me. He's doing great. and. Uh, he taught me so much and continues to teach me things, but I bought, I bought the business from him in 2014 and then I was on my own and uh, so excited about it. It was a very fair, I have a 20 year buyout agreement with him, millions of dollars. He pretty much gets to make what he was making then for the rest of his life um, and it'll be paid by the business. I hope he lives a lot longer than 20 years, but uh, I mean, uh, there was a buyout agreement, right? And I bought the business from him. And so one little story, uh, that was the beginning of 2014, in December of 2014, my anniversary is in December, and I've been married, actually this is gonna be my 30th anniversary, so I've been married 30 years, but we try to take an anniversary trip at least every other year, and more often if we can, but we were able to go that year, and we went to uh, Cozumel, I'm gonna jump ahead here because I have a, we went to Cozumel, one of our favorite things, and I speak Spanish, so I love to go to Mexican, vi Mexican destinations, but one of our favorite things to do is to go out on this little catamaran, and they let you do that in Cozumel. And uh, you just get out there, the winds, once you learn how to drive it, and you're not getting afraid to tip over, it's just kind of peaceful and you can talk. And so my conversation with her when I went on that trip was, I'm at the end of a $50,000 credit line, and payroll is due this week. And that's what I went on vacation. One year after I bought the business from my dad, that's what it was like going on vacation. And that's what owning a business is like, right? So I honestly was just praying, and we have checks come in every day, we're a subscription business, that enough checks would come in to pay the payroll because I had nowhere to go. I was at the end of that, end of that credit line. And so it was stressful. And not only that, I didn't understand taxes like I did. Me and my dad had switched over the years between handling the finances, the books. He'd done it most of the time, but there'd been a few, I'd done it for a few spells over that uh, 16 years that we were partners. And so I understand the books a little bit, getting into taxes and stuff, I did not understand. Number one, I didn't understand the tax, tax implications of me buying him out, which the way it was set up was pretty much that uh, the money in a pastor entity like a sub S or an LLC, which Construction Monitor is, that the money flows through to the owner, so you have all your business expenses and all your revenue and what's left over after the expenses and all that stuff is what you pay taxes on. It flows through to your personal return, uh, my wife's return too. And so I didn't understand that not only did I pay him that, I had to pay taxes on that money, which you know, it doesn't take long before you get up into the higher tax bracket and so that's almost like paying an extra 30 to 42 percent federal and so those are some things that I didn't understand and I had a consultant another thing that I went to and this was kind of an ongoing thing I try and go every quarter but I had a guy tell me and I shared two things with him that uh, that were really troubling me first of all I was behind on my taxes I couldn't afford to pay my taxes it just wasn't it was hard enough to pay my bills right I mean pay payroll we had weekly payroll so every week an ever-growing payroll in the thousands to the tens of thousands of dollars so payroll and taxes, and uh, well taxes. So the first thing was, ta if, let me go to the easier thing. Number one is I told him I love, I love to program computers. I really wanted to do that more. And he said, run this business, make it successful, and you can do it whenever you want. You can do it on your own time. But he pretty much told me right now, that's not what you need to be doing. It made sense. He says, you need to be running this business. You need to make sure it succeeds. So that's fine if you want to program, you can do it later or on your own time. It can be your hobby. And he was right. That was an aha moment for me. Number two, he said taxes, you gotta treat them like an expense. And you just gotta pay them. That's what they are. 
it's an expense. And so from that moment on, uh, and that was in the, that was in the, after that horrible vacation where I saw in the hole, uh, the next fall I'd met with him. And from that moment on, I started putting away a substantial amount of money every week automatically uh, to pay my taxes with. It was more than I needed for taxes, but it actually turned into be a real big blessing because down the road it helped me with some of the real estate things that I, if I have time I'll touch on just a little bit. And so here's the growth of the business, a uh, number of permits entered each year. You can see we were growing pretty good and just a little bit of a down click right around 2008. But this is the number of permits. Now this doesn't include just growth and building permits throughout the United States, but us expanding into different areas too. And so this year, yeah, we're, we're already over 3 million in the last 12 months. And this year will be well over 3 million to get us up to about 25 or 26 million. And this is some, kind of some of the stats that we have. You know, the active areas, we, what does that say? 96 areas. And we cover all the states and 3224 jurisdictions so sometimes monthly sometimes they don't let us get them weekly but at least uh once a month we're checking with and sometimes every week we're checking with 3224 jurisdictions to get this information and that kind of shows you some of the stats and i don't know if you can see it clear in the back but that's the that's the work that we do okay so now kind of so construction monitor has just been a a blessing it really has and the number one important thing well I'm skipping around on my but right up top here is uh, my team this was taken a little bit while ago it doesn't include everybody um, but this is my team up on top and they're important and they're there you know so back in the old days you couldn't this this remote thing wasn't as big and so you had to hire a remote and so that team, some of them did come from Salt Lake and, and stuff, but most of them were just hired right here in Cedar City. And they're a diverse group, right? But the team's important because I can't do everything myself. And like I say, until 2008, I was a heads down programmer and I hired a kid that was just graduating, Daniel Height, and just graduating from here. Phenomenal. He's still with me after 15 years. He's still with me. I hired a guy on the end in the bright blue shirt, Orion. Uh, he he cut out of college a little early because he liked the job so much. Don't do that, but he's still with me, and he's making he's a salesperson and he's really good at what he does. And then actually, I was in a local Toastmasters group, and uh, one of my managers came from there. And then Karen, you can kind of see her behind the girl in the yellow hair, just barely her head. She's my been my customer service manager for since two th that about that same time, 2007, and so. Good people wouldn't be where I'm at today without them. Uh, so I wanted to throw that in before I forgot and kind of move on to how this feeds into my whole life. And we're getting almost to the question time, question and answers. But so as I, and really two things is I, you know, I bought the business from my dad and I was able to grow it from, we were about 2 million in revenue. And then it's grown since then to about 6 million in revenue, just under 6 million in total gross re revenue. That's, that's the size of business we are. I know that's always interesting to everybody. But just from right here in Paro, and it's been advantageous to us since the pandemic because the city halls now are more open to us requesting the information electronically. And even though we can hire throughout the world, uh, we do. But we also hire locally. We love to hire local, and we still work with the college to hire interns and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's been, it, it's, it's been good. And so it, the, that and saving for taxes. So now I had a little bit of money and this is kind of the last chapter to my story. A little bit of a side note, but I've been able to, I've always had a big thing about, first of all, I had a CDL so I could drive trucks when I was cleaning out those trucks. I got my CDL. That was my backup plan to be a truck driver. I didn't ever have to use that other than for fun. If I wanted to go with my father-in-law once in a while, but uh, driving truck was my backup. Another important thing to me was uh, multiple streams of income because construction monitor, there are serious, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. There are threats. And, you know, public information privacy laws are a big threat to our business. We're very careful with private information. We don't publish phone numbers much anymore and stuff. And even though it's a prize of service to these homeowners because they got to get all these different trades in there. Uh, still, privacy is a big thing. So there's a lot of threats to construction monitor. It always worried me uh, that my business would evaporate. And for a moment there, the pandemic, I thought it was for sure going to evaporate and I wouldn't have a way to feed my family. And so uh, that got me into some other things. Real estate, number one. So I started buying a couple of houses because my kids were looking for places to live. And I'm like, oh, I'll take their rent money and buy a house with it. And I did that. And then one day, 
I had a friend that worked for a utility company. He was uh, one of the houses I bought. I actually bought two over here on 300 West, so I kind of cut off the lot. I didn't know what I was going to do with that. I cut off the block, but I figured if anybody else wanted to develop, they'd have to go through me or around me. But they couldn't go around me, so they'd have to go through those two properties I had. And then I had a friend share that down here looking at this place over here on 800 West, they said they were installing some utilities there. It says, man, they have 10 units. Each one of those units has 10 bedrooms and 10 private bathrooms, and they charge $425 a month in rent. So that's a multiple of 10. It's pretty easy for you to work through in your head, 10 times, 10 times four, you know? So I'm like, I'd love to have $42,000 a month. I didn't know anything about expenses, costs, and they are vast with an apartment complex. But anyways, that got me into this T-Bird Heights, which is just up here on 300 West, same building, same contractor. Same thing, I got a lifelong dream before that. Several years ago, I got to build my wife a dance studio. That's an absolute money loser, <laughs> but it was a dream that I had and important to her and I'm thankful that I was able to do it. So these are some of the houses that I tore down for the dance studios and then our, our office in Parallel and I don't have a picture of our office in Cedar for construction monitor. And so you know who the best renter is when you own a business and uh, the best renter is yourself. So I created a real estate company that rents to construction monitor and I'm a good tenant and I pay whatever I want to pay. So do you do that real estate company for taxes? So yeah, it does help. I mean, mostly just with itself. You can kind of, it's a good thing just to, I mean, once you take money out, you're going to get taxed on it. There's some ways to lessen that, but while it's growing, you know, I mean, it, it does kick off a little. I'm still not seeing any, po I'm finally getting to the point where I will see something from, uh, you know, the apartments. They're just finally full after some construction delays and stuff, but it, it can be a little bit of net positive, but then you got to be ready for vacancies and things. And so it's, it's a whole mixed ball. I could have a whole nother thing about it, but I don't want to forget a few things. So this business person of the year, it was quite the honor and it came from, and I, the Small Business Development Center, I don't know how many of you heard that, but going way back, we worked with Craig Isom, and now for so many years it's been Joni Anderson, she's here with us, and now uh, Grayson Jones has been helping, but they were a big part of our success. And this is, this is Grayson and Joni right here with Senator Vickers, who was kind enough to come over after I won the award. And I was nominated by them and uh, got an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. This is Administrator Guzman. She's in charge of the Small Business Administration. And then uh, we got to see, go to the White House, the Rose Garden. There's Joe Biden. He had a phone call. It was really important because we wanted to shake his hand. We just missed shaking his hand. Um, and then you got this, this guy. I think he's worried about me, the Secret Service agent there. But <laughs> anyways, uh, such a blessed opportunity. It really was. And uh, that's all. And not just that, but the things you can't understand everything yourselves. But over the years, the Small Business Development Center has helped me with everything. And I didn't get a chance to talk about government contracting except for the one little mention. They've helped us with government contracting, advertising, everything. Such a valuable resource. And tucked away in a small community here, you know, it's tough to network, even though I go to conferences all the time, but they provide the networking. And if they can't help you, uh, they can put you in contact with people. And that's been a big part of our success. So I'll wrap it up for questions. A couple other businesses I've started with my sons, an outsourcing business, which they provide a lot of the data entry and stuff for uh, Construction Monitor. My son Braden started that business. And then my son has a tree, term, tree trimming business and also wa federal government wildfire contracts to fight wildfires. Seems a little at odds, tree care and then fight fires, right? But um, so some other things I've been venturing into since then. So that's kind of, I want to give you time for questions if you have any, and that's construction monitor and me and, yeah. You talked about your father's first pivot Yeah, so, I mean, I'm always, like I said, I'm not very, what path, what were my crucial moments and stuff? Yeah, I mean, crucial moment is not having any money left in the bank and having to make payroll and <clears throat> deciding how far. This is the thing about being the owner of a business is sometimes your team, your employees and stuff don't understand that, you know, you're, you're digging a hole, so it's not like you can just walk away. You know, employees can kind of, 
uh, you'd never want that to happen, but they could find another job. You would have to find another job, plus you're digging a big hole. So there's been lots of moments. I had to borrow money against a truck. Both me and my dad did against a vehicle to keep it going right around 2000. And, uh, but for me, I mean, it was kind of when we went on that vacation, I'm like, can I run this business or not? Because, and really, I mean, at that point it was too late. So it was just out of necessity. I mean, I have to, I owe my dad all this money. And the only thing that could happen, he could come back in and take it back over. We could work on it together. I could let him have it back, but that was never an option in my mind. And so now looking back at it, you know, I mean, it was scary decisions, but I mean, you can fail, but you're not a failure, you know? So just, I'm gonna have missteps. I lost a little bit of money right before 2008. I invested it and lost some money. That was, it was like $55,000, but at that time that, that, that is and was a lot for me. And so each one of those failures like is a, kind of a big moment, but the big ones were, you know, in December and then the taxing, I had to get that underway and I shared kind of those stories. You just gotta, you just gotta go for it. I mean, <clears throat> you gotta be wise. You know, my wife, her, 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 she's very supportive and she's a big part of the reason uh, that all these things, the main part, I mean, have a beautiful family, five kids, two grandkids. Um, but without, you know, and I like to be an involved father, but without, you know, her, it would definitely have been more difficult and wouldn't be where I'm at today. But you got to make those decisions, you know, how am I going to support my family? And I mean, I would be back driving, delivering pizzas. I know all the addresses. I just go back to whatever I could. And so this is just a better option. So sometimes I stepped out for the better option, even though there's maybe a little more, a little more on the line. Good question. Thanks. Any other questions? Are you still, even after uh, COVID, are you still going to get the have independent contractors get those? So not very, I think only a few, very rare, because the cities are, they're also worried about it too, right? So they make it available electronically, which is great for us. We're a little bit worried, you know, that opens the door a little bit for competition. That was kind of one edge that we had is we had a network of people going and visiting these cities. Don't have that anymore because yeah, the cities, they're just getting used to making it available electronic, even though they're still very protective of it. Once you get past that, then they're, they'll make it available electronic. So how do you set yourself apart from your competition? So yeah, that's a good question. There's, we have few competitors because the key thing is just the timeliness of our data. We get it every week and we get it, you know, some one big competitor, they just kind of scrape all the stuff they can get from the big cities like Los Angeles has electronic data going back into the 80s even. And so they'll get the easy stuff, but it takes some time a few months. I didn't get a chance to talk about our technology, but on top of the data entry force that we have, which is now a lot of it outsourced, we have some technologies that do OCR and stuff. And so we've, we've implemented some good technologies and that, that's helped. And then we just stay, we're, we're the most timely. So you can get the information a couple other places. It's just going to be three or four months delayed and not nearly as crisp and clean and as accurate. So are your people still like pounding the pavement, so to speak, contacting these city offices and saying, hey, we need this information now, we need it now type thing? Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, my son Braden manages that department for me, the d data, and that is a lot outsourced, but they send out Freedom of Information FOIA requests every, every week, every month. And like it says, especially at the beginning of the month, they'll have 500 emails in that group email inbox, and they just do it. There's seven of them working on that. 24-7, even while we're sleeping because they're in Africa. Some of them, half the team, most of the team, that team is in Africa. Yeah. Have you ever thought about going to the engineering company before the permits are even approved? So, so that's kind of a different thing. You get, you get like Dodge Reports and Zonda, weird name, but Zonda. And there's other companies that do that. They call the architects. It's exactly like you're saying. That's called advanced planning. And we purposefully, we've had many conversations about dipping into that, but we've stayed right here just to focus, to catch our strengths. And I mean, it's a weird business, right? Every time I tell somebody about this business, it's like, they're like, whoa. And I'm like, yeah, there's a million ways to make money. And this, this is proof. I mean, especially back before data became such a big thing. You know, I mean, this was even now, it seems like, oh, that's good data, right? It makes sense. But before data was data, before anybody understood data, it was different. Yeah. Say that a little louder, a little louder. How did you market in the beginning and how do you still kind of continue to market? Good question. This was another one. I skipped this, but other than that check, we, my dad, 
My dad and my uncle, they went door to door, like in Salt Lake City, and my uncle did it up in Montana of all places, but they would go to these businesses that were a good fit, right to their door, walk in the door and talk to the owners if they could, or somebody high up, that's how it started. And in, in southwestern Utah, when I came back off my mission, I'm going to school, I'm raising a family, I got three, four other jobs. My grandpa lived down there, and he would buy my grandma lunch to take him around all his business. He was an old sales, he was an old salesman, he worked for Circus Peanuts and the tobacco company, funny enough, but he was a salesman, I mean, that was his thing, he was retired by then, and he went door to door also. And then that changed a little bit. Uh, we started doing the, more of the phone as we expanded more phone sales. And then now we do, we spend about $1,000 a day on Google AdWords, between 500 and 1,000, like maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, about $1,000 maybe. Some, some days it's only 500, so $3,000 every five days on Google AdWords. And all that does is bring in leads to our salespeople that get on the phone and follow up on those. We have a little bit of email marketing, but it's mostly Salespeople get on the phone and call those up. So yeah, you want to get a lot of travel points on a credit card, pay for $500 of Google AdWords every day, $1,000 every day, adds up. Vacation, right? well, lots of vacations. <laughs> you haven't paid for a hotel room in years, right? And stay at the Hyatt with all these Chase, Chase Inc., Chase Sapphire points. Yeah, okay, any other questions? All right. So hopefully you got something. Thank you. Is that it?